We're going we're gonna to tackle several questions today. The first ones are, are kind of a little easier, and then we'll get to a big one. But there's, a, there's no such thing as a bad question. They're all really good questions. And uh, the first one, the first one for today is, did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? <laughs> did Adam and Eve have belly buttons? I don't know if you've ever thought about that before, but in the Garden of Eden, would they need a belly button if God created them from the dust? Did they really need a belly button? What do you think? I'm not sure. I can't tell you with certainty if they did or didn't have belly button. Maybe they didn't so that, uh, you know, the grandkids would say, hey, Grandpa Adam, tell us the story again about why you don't have a belly button. And then Adam would retell the account of creation. Or maybe they did have belly buttons because God just created them to be like a model of what humans would look like. Who knows? I don't know exactly how to give you a definitive answer to this question, whoever asked it. But what I can encourage you is when you read the Bible, always ask yourself, what is the point of the Bible? It's not a biology book, although it's biologically accurate. It's not a history book, but it's accurate to all other historical accounts. It's not a science book, but it's scientifically accurate. The reason why we have the Bible is so that God can speak to us and reveal his grand plan of what he is doing in this world and your part in it. That's the why. So sometimes we get so lost in the details, no interesting questions, belly buttons. What about the dinosaurs? How long did creation really take? Genesis doesn't really tell us the answers to those things, but it does give some suggestions. And part of the beauty of the Bible is it leaves space for us to dream and to wonder about this creative God. The second question that we have is, what was written on Jesus' sandals when he ascended up to heaven when he went back there? I have no idea, but the best I could come up with was maybe it was the inspiration for the first pair of Nike Airs. I don't know. I don't know. Does, does God think that we are funny at times? I think maybe he thought we were funny right there. So there's different places if you read through scripture where God laughs. He laughs at his enemies. In Zephaniah it says God rejoices. He delights over us with singing. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. God is a creative God. I think he created humor. Yes, I think he thinks that you are funny uh, a lot of the time. Um, I think he... he He's all about humor. I ask my kids this question, is, is what do you think about God's sense of humor? Do you think he's serious all the time? And they're like, no, I, I don't think he's serious all the time. I think he laughs at us because he invented laughter. Yeah. There's a cool story in 1 Samuel chapter 5, uh, just to express, I think, how I imagine God to be, where the Philistines, they capture the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence is, and they take it into their temple. It's the temple of Dagon, which is their God. It's a big stone idol. And during the night, God knocks Dagon over. So the people go into the temple the next day, and Dagon is on his face before the temple, or before the Ark of the Covenant. So they kind of lift him back up, they prop him back up, and then uh, they go home for the night, and they come back the next day. And this time, Dagon's on his face again, but this time his head has fallen off and his hands have fallen off. So the Philistines then are like, take this Ark away, get it out of here. I, th I imagine God sitting there like with the angels, like, hey, guys, watch this, watch this. Watch this. <laughs> What are the Philistines going to think when they come into their, their temple? I absolutely think God thinks that we are funny. Another question, this is the last of the lighter ones for today. When are you coming back? When are you coming back? Someone asked, they want to ask God, Jesus, when are you coming back? In fact, the answer is in the Bible, the second to last verse, Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, second to last verse of the Bible. John writing, and he's writing about Jesus, and he says this, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. If it was a South African translation, the footnotes would say, now, now, or just now. You don't know when exactly it is, but it's sometime in the future, and it's going to be soon, and it's going to be a surprise. I will be there now, now. I will be there just now. Keep the questions coming. You can send them to us by email, WhatsApp. You can drop them in the inbox. There's papers at the back. You can write them on. Uh, we'd love to hear some more of the questions. We've got so many in already, and we're trying to navigate through which are the ones that kind of group them together to be able to answer them in the best way possible. So that brings us to today's question, which is simply this. God, how could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? God, how could you let this happen? God, how could you let this happen? How could you let this happen? What is this for you? 
What, what is the thing that's happened in your life where you've gone angrily with emotion to God and, or, or perhaps to your friends about God and you've just been like, God, how, how could you let this happen? If, if he's a God of love, how could he let this happen? How could he just turn a blind eye and, and let this happen to me or to him or to her or to them? Like, where are you, God? How could you let this happen? This is something that we all struggle with in our lifetime. We, we wrestle with this question. We ask, like, God, how could you... How could you just let this happen? Why did you do something if you are all powerful? Why did you stop it? Why didn't you step in and do a miracle? How could you let this happen? Maybe for you it's a story of abuse. Maybe someone has abused you emotionally or physically or sexually or verbally recently or a long time ago for a short time or years and years and years and your question in your heart, perhaps you haven't expressed it in these words, but the sense that you have in you is a questioning about God. How could you let this happen to me? I I was just a kid. Where were you, Jesus? Or perhaps you know someone or have experienced in in your close family the loss of a child, perhaps a a baby that is stillborn or a miscarriage or, or a young child who passes away or was born with a disability. And at some level in you, there's this wrestle, at least it's in me, is God like, how could you let this happen? Like, what have they done? It's just a child. Or perhaps you've been a victim of crime. And for many of us, that's a reality in this country. We've been directly affected by it, or someone that we know in our families has, has been a victim of some kind of crime or violence, and our life is kind of going along, and it's just fine. And all of a sudden, in a moment, everything changes because of the decisions of someone else. And you go, God, why didn't you protect me? Why didn't you stop it? Is anyone with me? Have you been there? Or, or perhaps for you, it's, it's been bad news from the doctor. And this is where our family is right now. Y- yesterday was my late dad and my mom's wedding anniversary. I think it would have been there. I don't know, 56th wedding anniversary or something. So 16 years ago, just before my dad passed away, they dressed up in their wedding clothes. This would have been their 40th wedding anniversary. And when I saw this big, uh, pop up on a photo memory yesterday, I, I was just began to cry and cry and cry. Because this week we heard that my mom has stage four cancer. And I go, God, God how could you let this happen? Not once, but, but twice. Now, our family has a mountain ahead of us as we navigate and and we move forward. And I say that to tell you not because I'm looking for sympathy, but to let you know that I'm with you when difficult things happen and there's a wrestle in us and we wrestle with God and His goodness and we sing about how powerful God is and how good He is, but in us there's something that goes, but how? I can't reconcile your goodness that I read about and that I know about with, with the experiences and the circumstances in my life. God, how could you let this happen? Or perhaps you read the headlines and you see about a natural disaster that's happened in some other country, an earthquake or a tsunami, and you're like, God, like, how could you let this happen? Hey, what did those people ever do? This is, a, this is a question that we wrestle with, I think, on two levels. The first one is when it's out there, and we kind of, it's easy to say, God, why did you let it happen to them? God, how, how could you send that tidal wave there? Why did you let that earthquake happen over there? And it's kind of, it's almost a removal of our experience of it because it's like one step removed. It's not directly affecting us. And it's easy to question then and say, God, how could you let that happen? And by the way, I think that the same voices that ask this question are often the same voices that say, God, how could you send the flood to deal with all this evil on the earth? I know it's not, I mean, you can take these notes for the other Christian friends of yours that you have. And share it with them one day and just listen to their voices. Like, God, how could you let this evil has stuff happen on the one hand? And then on the other hand, God, how, how could you be so cruel just to send a flood to deal with evil on the earth? God, how could you let all this crime happen? God, how could you destroy the city of Sodom to deal with evil? It's on the one level. On the second level, which is probably where the real wrestle is, is when life is just carrying on as normal and suddenly there's like a bomb that drops in your life and it's the destructive force that comes and now it's real and it's in you and you're faced with it and and it's your story. And then you wrestle with the question, God, how could you let this happen? Where are you in this? And sometimes we respond, if we, if we are not careful, if we're not taking responsibility for our spiritual journey, we respond in an immature way and we put all the blame of it on God. Instead of 
realizing where we fit into the narrative of Scripture and realize at some level, every single one of us is responsible for the evil that happens in the world. It's very easy to remove it from ourselves and ask someone else, why did you do this? Why did you do that, God? Why did you let that happen? And we don't acknowledge our own brokenness and role in the system. And it's a very tough verse, but this is what, this is what Paul says about it in Romans 5. He says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, belly button or not, this guy, sin came through him and death through sin. That's, that's, a, that's a, not a physical death, but an eternal separation from God. In this way, death spread to all people, to every single one of you, because, because all have sinned. So at some level, all of us are responsible for the, the brokenness that we experience. It's not always the fault of someone else. I, I don't want to minimize anyone is, anyone's experiences in the room. And sometimes they are true victims of the choices of others. But at some level, we, are, we have to acknowledge that all of us are broken. Without the grace and power and transformation of Jesus, all of us are somehow connected to this axis of evil that results in the suffering and brokenness that we see in the world. At least that, that's the foundation that we hold on to that, and, and our understanding that, of, of what we see in the Scriptures. But this is not a new question. This is something people have wrestled with for years and years and years. In fact, in philosophy, there's a whole branch of philosophy called theodicy, which deals with exactly this question. Is, is how does evil and God coexist? How do you reconcile the two? So it's very, it would be very inappropriate of me to try and just answer this question in simplicity. But, but let's have a look at what some have said. The, the, one of the most famous quotes when it comes to theodicy is from a Greek philosopher named Epicurus. And he said this, Is God willing to prevent evil, but he's not able? Well, then he's, om, he's not omnipotent. In other words, then he's not all-powerful. Is God able to prevent evil, but he's not willing? Well, then he's, he's malevolent. In other words, he's not all good. Is he both able and willing? Well, then where does evil come from? Is he neither able or willing? Then why do we call him God? And perhaps you don't know many Greek philosophers... So to contextualize it and paraphrase it a little bit, there's another philosopher who you might know a little better. His name is Lex Luthor. And in the Batman versus Superman, in the Dawn of Justice, there's this scene where he's, he's recounting how he was abused by his father. And in his conversation with Clark Kent, he says, if God is all-powerful, then he cannot be all-good. In other words, if God was powerful enough to stop the abuse that happened to me, he didn't, therefore he cannot be all good. He kind of uses this deductive logic to reach the conclusion that because of his experience, God can't be all good. And if he's all good, if he really is all good, then he can't be all powerful because if he was all good, he would have, he would have stopped the abuse of my father to me. And, and the thing is, what Lex Luthor does, as many of us do, is we base our definition of who we think God is based on the experiences that have happened to us. So we project what our experience is on God. And we say, because of this, then God can't be there. Is there a different way that we can reconcile the existence of God and evil in our lives? So this is the question. I'm going to give you the question now. And this is, this is kind of the PG part that Peter was talking about. The, someone in this community sent this question. I'm not sure who it is, but thank you for your question if you sent it in. And they said, here's the question. How, how did you still knit me together in my mother's womb at conception, even though I was the product of a rape act? How does something so beautiful come from such a revolting situation? And how can I explain this to a world who doesn't know you? There's few words that carry more emotional charge than the word rape. And tragically, in our country, this is the reality for so many. Statistics say that in, in their lifetime, four out of ten women will be the victim of a rape act in our country. Could, could I ask the men in the room just to stand for a moment? 
just take a look around. And I'll ask you to do that because generally in church there's about 40% men and 60% women. So if everyone in here was a woman, this is the number of you that would suffer as a victim of a rape act in our country. And one out of nine of those are actually reported. You guys, thank you. You can, you can take your seat. So, so the person who asks this question, it comes out of Psalm 139. I'll read it to you. There's, there's a passage. The psalmist says this. For it was you who created me in my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. And I will praise you because I have been re- remarkably and wondrously made. Your works, God, they are wondrous, and, and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless, and all my days were written in your book, and they were planned before a single one of them began. Do, do you see the tension in this problem? Is, is God, okay, I, I'm the product of a rape act, but I'm, what I'm reading here is that you planned my life before it began. So perhaps another way to, to say this question is, God, did you plan that this evil would happen and result in my life? If I were, and, and I hope that I'm representing the question fairly, but that's my understanding of it, is that's the question behind the question, is, God, did you sit down when you created everything and you planned out everyone's lives, did you plan that there was going to be a rape act that happened and then I would be born from that? Did you plan that? And how do I explain that to someone who doesn't know you? Like, I'm here, this is my life, and this is my past. Did you plan my past, God? Did you plan it? This, I think, is the essence of the question. But I love the the last part of the question, because there's kind of three questions laid in there, is, is how do I explain this to other people? So there's a heart that wanting to wrestle with this and wanting to find truth so that the testimony can come from it's not just a question that's looking to put blame on God, but God, help me understand this. Help me wrestle with this so that you can give me a story, a testimony, where I can speak about your goodness. Because deep down, I know you're good, but I'm battling to tell from what's happened to me in my experience, in my past, I'm battling to, to reconcile that. So instead of trying to answer this with just one question, because Psalm 39, it's a, it's a revelation of the worshiper who's saying, he, he, the, the, as, as he's writing this, it's like, my mind is blown when I think about what you have done, God that you are the source of life, of how you plan things and you connect things all together. I just can't begin to comprehend it. And instead of, instead of trying to just you know, give a, a one-sentence answer, I think the best thing to do is to look at a story in Scripture, which many of you, if you've been around church for some time, you'll, this story will be familiar for you. If you have never heard it before, that's fantastic. I'll explain it to you and give it uh, to you. It's a story of, of Joseph in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, Adam and Eve, the belly button people, right at the beginning, and then a little bit later on, we meet Joseph and his family. And before we get to Joseph, I want to tell you a little bit about Joseph's dad, Jacob. And, and Jacob, we read about him. The first kind of idea we get about Jacob is um, he's a manipulator and he's deceitful. Because Jacob and his, his mom, um, they kind of put this plot together to steal Jacob's brother's birthright. So Jacob and his mom tricked Jacob's dad into stealing a birthright. So this is like Jacob on the scene. A little bit more context to his story is is one day he decided there was a woman he wanted to marry, so he worked. He made an agreement to work for seven years so that he could have a hand in marriage. At the end of seven years, his uncle tricked him and gave him another woman. So Jacob, he worked for another seven years to get the woman, to get the girl he actually wanted, and then he had these two wives after 14 years. Peter thinks it's too much. The story gets, the story continues. Let me say it that way. So the first wife was called Leah and the second wife was called Rachel. Now it comes time to have kids because having kids was important in that time. So, so Jacob, he, he really likes Rachel, so he wants Rachel to have kids. But the problem is that Leah gets pregnant first. And, and Leah um, has four kids, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And Rachel is on the sidelines watching this, and she wants to have kids, but she doesn't, so she has this idea. She said, well, let me take my slave woman and send the slave woman to my husband, and then he can have kids with my slave woman, and then I'll have kids. So she does that, and she sends Billa to Jacob, and we don't read that Jacob's like, no, no, don't do this. This is not a good idea. And Billa gets pregnant, and and Billa has Dan and and Naphtali. Now there's six kids in the mix from, from two women. 
And then, and then Leah, in the meantime, she can't have any more kids because she's already done after four of them. So she's like, well, this is not fair. I've got four. Now there's two by the slave woman. I'm going to get my slave woman. So she calls Zilpah and sends Zilpah to Jacob. And Jacob, again, we don't read about him going like, no, no, this is not a good idea. He, he just like, you know, he just listens to his, his wife. And then and Gad and Asher appear on the scene. And now there are eight kids in the mix from three, from three women. And then the craziest thing happens. All of a sudden, Leah gets pregnant again. And Issachar and Zebulun appear. And now there are 10 kids in the mix. And finally, 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 Rachel gets pregnant. And Joseph is born. And a little bit later, Benjamin. But tragically, Benjamin's mom dies in, in childbirth. And, and, and that's the end of, of Rachel's story. And as Joseph grows up, he begins to have dreams. Now remember, he's got 11 brothers, 10 of them older than him, one younger than him. And he goes to the 10 older brothers, who all, most of them have different moms, and he starts to assert his authority, and he tells them, like, one day, you guys are going to bow down to me. <laughs> Can you imagine how that would go down? Well, a couple of threads I want you to pick up on in, in the story. There's some womanizing going on. There's poor husbandry. There's sibling rivalry. There's favoritism. There's deceit. This is a dysfunctional family at its worst. And some of you haven't read the Bible before, and you just figured, like, everyone in there is good people. I, I, you got some stuff to learn. You got a way to go. This makes me feel better about my family. So then the story continues, and these 10 older brothers, they start to scheme together, and they plot, and they say, let's kill our 11th brother. And one of them stands up and says, no, no, don't kill him. Let's rather just sell him to slaves, because that'll be better. So, so they, they sell him to slaves, and then they take his coat, and they cover it in some animal blood, and they take it to Jacob, and they say, your son's been eaten by a wild beast. How's that for a family secret? Imagine dinner table conversations where poor dad is crying about the son and, and the ten brothers, and maybe Benjamin knew, I'm not sure, maybe he was in on it, I don't know. And, uh, and they, they kind of like, don't tell dad, don't tell dad. And Joseph is sent off to Egypt, and he ends up being sold as a slave into the Egyptian culture, and he, he ends up in a, a guy's house called Potiphar, he's an influential person in the land. And, and Joseph is faithful in what he does, and, and he's promoted but then Potiphar's wife has an eye for Joseph. He must have been like a good-looking guy. So she comes after him, and, and he runs away. But then she tells a story about him. Again, we see this thread of deceit, and, and he's falsely accused of abusing her, so he's thrown into prison. And he's in prison for years and years and years, kind of forgotten about. And then he reappears at, at, when, when his prison mates begin to have dreams, and they have some influence with Pharaoh. And eventually... Joseph gets an audience before Pharaoh, who's the most powerful man in the world at that time. And Joseph, he, he's able, with the power of God, to interpret Pharaoh's dream and tell, it, tell him what it means. And Pharaoh is so impressed by him that he promotes Joseph from the prison and makes him second in charge of the land of Egypt. Second most powerful man in the world. And Joseph's story goes like this. It goes from the pit where his brothers threw him into Potiphar's house, into the prison, and suddenly he's in the palace with Pharaoh. And he has all this influence. And it takes years and years and years for him to get there. And then meanwhile, Jacob and the sons, they're living uh, in their land and the, things get really bad. There's a famine there. And so they, they come to Egypt because that's the only place where there's any food stock. And they arrive in Egypt and suddenly Joseph recognizes, here come his brothers, the same ones that sold him into slavery all those years ago. And, and most of us, I think if we're in the story, we go like, now it's time for revenge. And what Joseph does is he begins to test their hearts. He puts them through a few tests to, to really ascertain, like, has something shifted in their hearts, or are they still like they used to be? And when he's, when he's satisfied that something has shifted in them, he reveals himself to them. And he says, I am Joseph, your brother. The Bible is full of incredible, incredible stories that speak into our lives today. And as they have this conversation, his, his brothers are kind of repenting before him, and they're fearing for the worst because they know if they were in his place, they probably would have killed, and, and they're wondering what is the fate that awaits them. And, and Joseph says, hey, guys, don't worry. Why don't you bring all your families and bring them to Egypt because there's food here? And, and just by the way, these 12 guys become 
the 12 tribes of Israel. Are, are you picking up on, on a thread here that God can use pretty dysfunctional, messed up people, broken people to bring about? In fact, Judah, if you've ever read anything about Jesus before, J Judah's kind of up there in the lineage of Jesus, the lion of Judah, the same guy. I'm not even going to start to tell you about Judah's antics. You can go read them for yourself in the book of Genesis. And Joseph says this line, which we often refer to, but the story is helpful for the context. In Genesis 50, verse 20, he says, You, my brothers, you planned evil against me, but God planned it for good to bring about the present results, the survival of many people. We can hold on to that, but we can also miss something in this verse because from this verse, we get the idea that God plans evil because you planned evil against me, but God planned it for good. Did God plan the evil for good? Did God plan the rape act for good? Did God plan the evil tragic thing that you experienced, that you went through? Did he plan that for good? Because we can read the verse like that and get that idea. God planned, you planned it for evil, but God planned it for good. How do we... How do we understand this? So the word here for planned is the, is the Hebrew word hasab. And one of the synonyms for that is to weave. And, and I think this is a very helpful picture to understand how this works. Is I don't think it's the case of God sitting down in the beginning of eternity, whenever that was, or before he created, and like planning everything out, and planning, well, this is going to happen, then this is going to happen, I'm going to plan for the evil thing to happen, and then I'm going to bring about good from it. Rather, read it like this, is you weaved this for evil against me, but God weaved it for good. So what this speaks about is the free will of man which God gives us, and then God's response to faithful hearts which follow him and trust him, and it tells us how God can take something that was weaved by the enemy for weevil, uh, weevil <laughs> pick up the thread, and weave it for good. And it got me thinking about tapestries. I, I don't know if Patricia's here today, but just by the way, Patricia's won many awards for her tapestries here. She's actually quite famous for putting tapestries together. So I thought, well, let me Google which is the most famous tapestry in the world. And there's one in the UK called the Bayer Tapestry, which is from the 11th century. And this tell, tells the story of the Norman conquest in, in, in England, Battle of Hastings, and it, it's got like so many different scenes and character, over 200 characters in this tapestry and it took years and years for people to stitch this together and tell the story. And as I was reading more about this, I found, hey, do you know what we have here in South Africa? We have the Kaisgama Tapestry, which is 120 meters. I mean, take that, UK. <laughs> 50 meters longer tapestry which tells the story of the Eastern Cape from the sand people until the 94 democratic elections and tells the story of it. And what happened is people sat and they, they weaved the story together. 120 meters. This, this usually lives in Parliament, but remember the fire in Parliament in Cape Town? The tapestry survived. And it is <laughs> survived. Thank you, Zach. And it has recently been on display at uh, Constitution Hill. This is part of our heritage. But what, you, what I want you to think about as a tapestry is just how long it takes to weave a long story together. God weaves what the enemy intends for evil. He weaves it for good and he tells a story. And you can see the Bible like this as a tapestry that begins in Genesis and it ends in Revelation where Jesus says, I'm coming back now, now, just now. And in between is where you and I get weaved into the story that God is putting together. And this helps frame some of the context of our lives because our lives is what we know and the experiences that we have, that's the biggest thing that we've ever faced is the thing that's in front of us right now or the thing that we've just gone through or went through 10 years ago. Like that was the biggest thing. But in the context of the tapestry that God is weaving, those moments is kind of just like one stitch, one thread in a grand narrative of what God is doing. And, and in that narrative, it begins in Genesis and, and here's where we begin to get an understanding of how evil comes about is God starts things as perfect and created kingdom of heaven, kingdom of earth together, humans and God together and ruling by invitation. And in the end of the tapestry, we see Revelation, the same thing, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God together, kingdom of earth, God and his people ruling together and there's unity and there's peace and there's perfection. And in between is this mess that we find ourselves in because in the beginning of the story, 
It's in this place that man chose to rebel and to choose, if you will, to, to go, I, I don't want to be part of the tapestry that you're weaving, God. I, I want to write my own story. And it's in this moment that evil enters the world. Not by God's design, but by the choice of humans. And for perfect love to exist, which God is, there has to be, there has to be an option that this is rejected. And it's in this moment that the authority that is given to humans, God has given at this time in Genesis to humans, ultimate authority to rule alongside him. And they say, we don't want your authority, God. We're going to give the authority away to somebody else. And you and I live, that's a Romans 5, 12 verse that I read to you, we live in the fallout of that. But God is weaving what the enemy intended for evil for good. And right in the beginning of Genesis, he begins this rescue mission where he says, well, I, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take those decisions and those threads and those free will actions. I'm going to start to weave that for good. And it's going to take some time, but it's going somewhere. And one day the tapestry will be finished. And part of this, the, the, the kind of central piece is when Jesus came as God himself to earth. He so, said, well, I'm going to come. And that authority that was lost in Genesis, I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to give it to the church. And Christ died on the cross so that he could deal with the penalty of our rebellion. And then he was raised to life by the power of the Holy Spirit so that he could invite you and I to be part of a story that he's weaving with new life and new beginning to break off the past and to break open the future. And th this is the story that he's weaving. And God doesn't plan evil for, to happen, but because free choice was introduced in the beginning of the story, God doesn't abolish our free choice, but he leaves our free choice in place. But when there are decisions that are made that are contrary to his will and his design, his plan, what he does is when they're willing hearts, he begins to weave a story of good through that. This is how it works. And here's the thing is that God weaves with willing hearts. God weaves with willing hearts. He doesn't just force good upon anyone. But where there's a willing heart, a, faith, a heart that responds in faith, and God says, I, or you say to God, I don't understand this. I don't know how this has happened, but I'm willing, God, to be used in your story. It's at that moment that he takes whatever tragic thing has happened and begins to weave a thread of good. But you know what God doesn't weave with? Is hard hearts or hearts that are like wire because you need a thread that's soft and, and be able, that's malleable and, and can stitch in and out. But sometimes we just like piece of wire and say, God, that thing that's happened, like, is too much for me. I'm done. And our hearts towards God is like a piece of wire and it doesn't weave into the story. And some of you are in that place today where something tragic has happened to you and you've wrestled new questions so much that your heart has become hard towards God and you're asking, well, where's the good in this? And I want to tell you, to, I feel like God has impressed this upon me. Say, the good will come when you soften your heart and allow God to take what's happened and start to weave it to good. God weaves with, with willing hearts. So all the things that we go through, those difficult things, these tough times, there's an eternal context to this. There's a spiritual dimension. This life is not it. Your life here. What, the, the biggest challenge you're facing right now, like, frame it through this context. I don't want to minimize it, but just to understand, this is just like one stitch in that, in that tapestry that stretches for eternity. It's just, just one little moment. So how is it that we respond to Epicurus and, and to Lex Luthor? If, if God is all-powerful and he can't be all-good, and if he's all-good, then he cannot be all-powerful. The thing is that God is all-good, and all-powerful. And, and here's how we understand it, because if we say, is God all-powerful, I think what we actually are saying is, God should be able to give us free will and control us to stop evil all at the same time. When we say, God, are you all-powerful? You're not all-powerful. What we're really saying is, God, give me free choice to do what I want, but limit the choices of people who want to do evil to me. Let's think that through for a moment is you can't have control and free will at the same time. And God is all powerful because he's given humans free will. And we choose what we want to do with that. And when we don't like what's happened, then we put the blame on God. And God's like, but I gave you the free will that you asked for. And when we say God is all good, I think sometimes what we mean is that God is all good when he does things according to what I think is all good. God is all good when he acts in the way that I think he should act. 
And if he doesn't, well, that, mean, that must mean that he's morally flawed, because I'm not. I'm morally perfect. So if God and I differ on some issue, well, the problem must be with him. So he can't be all good. If God is not doing things in a way that I understand or agree with, then he can't be all good. If God is controlling me to stop me from having free will, but is allowing evil, then he can't be all powerful. So at its deepest, the argument that we have that God is not all powerful and all good actually doesn't make sense. God is all powerful and he is all good. And here's why. Because he has already acted against evil. And he did this when he sent Jesus to give his life on the cross and to be raised to life again because in that moment he dealt with evil. He dealt with the penalty that each of us have over our heads. He dealt with it in that moment and he invited every single one of us into a new life which is part of the kingdom of heaven where we're going to in Revelation. That's what we see at the end. Your invitation is to be part of that story and Jesus will come back now, now, just now, soon and when he does, evil will be banished for good. And in between what's happened is you and I, we live in this time where Jesus has come to deal with evil and the fulfillment of that. So we in the now and the not yet, he's come to deal with evil. He's already acted against it and he will act against it with finality. That's where we are. He's all good because he's already done that. And he's all good because he will not abolish your choice of free will. You always have a choice with him. If he wasn't, all good, he would just control you and you, you would be like a robot, just doing everything that God wanted you to do. But he's all good because he doesn't take away your free choice and the free choice of those others whose choices may tragically impact you. And he's all powerful and he's all good because he doesn't act according to your preferences and my preferences. And if you think about that long and hard, I think you'll probably be grateful for that because deep down you know what some of your preferences might be. And God is all good because he promises that in the midst of the affliction, in the midst of the now and the not yet, this is his promise. I'm the God of endless comfort. I'm the God of comfort, the God of endless comfort. He's good. He's all powerful. And I I wanna encourage you to hold on to this. No matter what you have faced, no matter what lies ahead, that the invitation into the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven is a place where those that are victims are raised up to be victors. The kingdom of heaven, which you step into by putting your faith in Jesus Christ and becoming part of that now, not waiting one day till you die, but living in that reality now, that's a place where, where those that are hurting find healing and find help. The kingdom of heaven is the place where those that are, feel like complete outcasts, they find a place at the table. The kingdom of heaven is a place where those that are proud are humbled and the humbled are exalted. It's the upside down kingdom. This life is not all that there is. This is the truth that we hold on to. God is all good and he's all powerful. And we know that because Christ has died and Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. And in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the struggle, this is what we hold on to. Is God is with you and he's for you and he's the God of endless comfort. And he's weaving a story together that is gonna be incredibly, incredibly beautiful. The most epic story ever told. And the question that I have for you is, will you be a thread in the story of God? Or will you be like a wire and say, God, I don't want to be part of your story. Why don't you stand to your feet? We'd love to create a space for for God to do some work in our hearts. And today it's going to be like something emotionally charged, perhaps bringing up some memories of, of things that you are facing, dealing with, have dealt with, whatever those things may be. 
but it's also a place while, while that is very real and true it's a place where you can step into the presence of God in a greater way where you can lean into his presence you can experience him you can find healing you can find you can find comfort I believe that God wants that for, for many of the of the women in the room that have have been victims of rape acts I believe God wants to bring healing to you today I'm not quite sure how we're going to get there and do that, but we're going to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit to bring things out in our hearts. I feel there's some of you in the room that are victims of, of abuse. God wants to set you free from that. He wants to break your past off and break open your future. Because your past, it's delivered you here to this moment. It's brought you here. But it doesn't have to define who you are when you walk out. It doesn't have to define your future. But what it can be is a story, a moment where one day you sit across the table from someone and you say, you know what, that person intended this for evil. They planned it for evil, but you know what God did? He weaved it for good. I believe there's people in the room who've lost loved ones. You've been wrestling with God about that. You're angry with Him. How could you let this happen to that person? I believe God wants to meet you today where you are and just... And just pour his love and his comfort upon you and set you free from that burden. And to know that he's with you and for you.